Thank you. The next item of business is a debate on motion 14431 in the name of Kate Forbes on programme for government growing Scotland's green economy. I would invite those members who would wish to speak in the debate to please press the request to speak buttons and I call on Kate Forbes, Deputy First Minister, to speak to and to move the motion around 12 minutes please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I know that the whole Parliament is united in expressing its disappointment at Petro Ineos' decision to cease refining at Grangemouth in 2025. Despite the collaborative efforts of the Scottish and UK governments over two administrations, it is deeply regrettable that Petro Ineos have chosen this course of action. And our first thoughts are, of course, with the workers, and that's why we have immediately announced a package of measures to support Grangemouth and the wider local geography, targeted skills intervention for impacted workers, an enhanced Falkirk and Grangemouth growth deal, and support for Project Willow, Petro Ineos's cross-site study to examine future low-carbon options for the site. But, presiding officer, today's news highlights the urgency of the just transition which is why the publication of our Green Industrial Strategy is so timely. Because it's even more important that we seize on the opportunities of a net zero economy. The Green Industrial Strategy has a clear and powerful mission to ensure that Scotland realises the maximum possible economic benefit from the opportunities created by the global transition to net zero. I will. Willie Rennie. Before she moves on our industrial past, would she care to comment about the situation at Liberty Steel? I hear some very concerning reports about the future of the plant. Has the Deputy First Minister had discussions with Liberty Steel? And if so, what were the outcome of those discussions? Deputy First Minister. Uh, are engaging um, on the basis of all of Scotland's uh, key industrial sites, key assets. We know that there are uh, challenges across the economy and our commitment to the workers at that site uh, and indeed to um, other sites that are key in the just transition uh, remains and that engagement is ongoing. But we, uh, presiding officer, want to make certain that the growth of the world's net zero economy means good, well-paid jobs here in Scotland. Jobs for today and jobs for future generations. But that isn't inevitable. It doesn't happen by accident. And so, as I said before, seizing the opportunities requires decisive action. And the Green Industrial Strategy is decisive because it's focused on securing investment across Scotland in the critical national infrastructure that our new economy demands and in the ports, the harbours and the highly productive businesses that find their place in globally competitive supply chains. Graeme Simpson. Um, we need Mr Simpson's uh, is, microphone. Is mm -hmm. there. Yeah. Thank the Deputy First Minister for taking the intervention. She talks about good, well-paid jobs in Scotland. Um, she may be aware of the announcement from Alexander Dennis today uh, that they could be shedding um, around about 160 jobs. Um, they are blaming the, uh, Scottish, bus, uh, the, the Scottish Bus Fund, um, which has funded more vehicles in China than from anywhere else, and certainly not in Scotland. Now, that is a serious issue, and uh, could the Cabinet Secretary say something about that? Um, well, I thank, First Minister. thank the member for that question. It's an extremely uh, important issue, and in fact, one that has uh, received uh, the First Minister's attention as well as the Transport Secretary's uh, attention. Uh, we have got to find ways of supporting uh, these businesses, obviously operating within uh, subsidy control measures uh, whilst we do so. But there is no doubt about the significant importance of Alexander uh, Dennis. And so, uh, presiding officer, uh, getting back to uh, the subject before us in terms of the green industrial strategy, we have choices to make now which will shape the future. And we choose to make Scotland more prosperous for the next generation of Scots in this strategy. But it's prosperity with a purpose. Prosperity as a vehicle to improve public services and a just transition to net zero, which has fair work at its heart and leaves nobody behind. Now, of course, the Green Industrial Strategy isn't the start of a journey. We've got solid foundations on which to build. 
Since 2007, Scottish GDP growth per head has been higher, and our productivity growth has been more than double that of the UK. Our unemployment has been at near record lows for the last eight years. And while those are impressive feats, we are tethered to a UK economy that has stagnated. Most parties agree with that. Even if we do not have the full economic powers that independence would bring, there is still much we can and will do to help Scotland prosper today. We face many challenges, from the pressures on our public finances to the hurdles we face to reach net zero by 2045. But those challenges are not insurmountable. And the message today is they offer enormous opportunity. If we can create the conditions for long-term economic growth, then the next generations of Scot Scots will benefit. And so that is what our programme for government did last week. It identified the actions that we're taking to create an environment that enables development, investment and job creation. Investment now is critical if we're to transform and grow our economy. We are seeing evidence of that already. Last year, the Japanese company Sumitomo confirmed its decision to build a £350 million high-voltage cable manufacturing plant at NIG. It's estimated that the plant will create around 330 jobs and bring £350 million of inward investment to Scotland. Now, they could have gone anywhere. They chose to come to Scotland and, indeed, to the Highlands. And that is just one of many projects that, for the ninth year in a row, makes Scotland the top performing region outside London for attracting inward investment. I will. Michael Mara. Appreciate, appreciate the Deputy First Minister giving way. Uh, it has been said to me by members of the industry that, for instance, a, a very large anchor contract, for instance, like Berwick Bank, that would uh, actually provide a ballast within the supply chain to allow the development of that supply chain over a period of years. We know that there have been very significant delays in the sanctioning of Berwick Bank. Can you give us any update as to when that might happen to try and unlock that economic potential? Deputy First Minister. Is experienced enough to know that that's a live application, so I won't comment on that. But let me comment on the principle, which is absolutely right, that we want to build clusters, essentially, where there's an activity uh, that attracts more businesses to uh, locate here and to uh, invest here. And that's what we're seeing around the port of Cromarty Firth, where, of course, uh, we saw Ardis Airport, on top of the £300 million of investment by Quantum Capital, a further £100 million of joint investment by the Scottish National Investment Bank and UK. Infrastructure Bank to put the port at the forefront of Scotland's energy transition and offshore wind capability. And that will inevitably create, we hope, more activity uh, in the area. Just today, the Scottish National Investment Bank has announced a £20 million investment in Zeroavia to bolster the aerospace supply chain and kickstart the market for hydrogen electric engines in Scotland. This is hugely exciting stuff. And so I want to make clear to the Chamber eh, and to those who are listening that Scotland is open for investment and we are open for business. We want to work with industry to capitalise on the opportunities that are in front of us and where we agree on the way forward to work constructively with the UK Government and its institutions too. Businesses across the country have told me of the importance of speeding up our planning processes to unlock investment. And that's why we've created a new planning hub to make quicker decisions on renewable and housing developments. And we've launched a planning apprenticeship programme to build a pipeline of skilled future planners. The planning hub will be based within the improvement service and will provide direct and immediate support to planning authorities. In this first year, it will focus on practical action to improve consenting for hydrogen developments, increasing capacity in the system and giving confidence to investors. We are also bolstering our resourcing across planning and consenting teams to improve engagement, introduce better guidance and ultimately increase the pace by which we determine applications. We are creating a business environment where Scottish entrepreneurs and innovators have the support required to take risks, to start up, to diversify, to expand. That includes maximising the impact of the tech scaler network, which already stands at over 700 businesses, raising over £70 million across all of them since they joined the programme. And we must not forget that Scotland's greatest asset is ultimately our people. We know that the transition to net zero will continue to create demand for new skills, while our current businesses require a skilled workforce. That's why we're ensuring workers in carbon intensive industries can access the skills development they need to seize new opportunities in growth sectors. 
and we are supporting a range of initiatives through the Just Transition Fund, such as the Energy Skills Transition Hub. We are also undertaking a significant reform of the skills and education system, a core aim of which is to make it more agile, more responsive to the skills requirement of Scotland's economy. We are taking the lead on national skills planning and strengthening regional skills planning approaches. And we are empowering people to join the workforce, taking important action to support women's participation in the economy, for example, through policies on funded early learning and childcare, alongside tackling workplace inequalities through the Fair Work First approach in public sector funding. So we've prioritised the actions that will deliver the underlying conditions for our economy to thrive and deliver in the net zero future, which we all want to see. Now, that requires us to also make substantial investment. The Scottish Government has limited borrowing powers for capital investment, and this strategy does not seek to compete with the scale of public investment, spending and subsidies attached to recent industrial strategies in the US, China or the European Green Deal. We need a UK Government that recognises and keeps pace with the level of capital investment required for net zero. Labour, I believe, once pledged they would invest an additional £28 billion a year, recognising the importance of that capital investment. So our strategy applies focus and it sets a clear direction. It prioritises opportunity areas where Scotland has existing strengths and where those strengths are most likely to lead to growth, including our exports. We want to target those opportunities which have the potential to reach significant scale in terms of value, create high quality jobs and the capacity to unlock or enable other industries, markets or opportunities with growth at home and abroad. Those strategies prioritise, that strategy prioritises five key opportunity areas. Wind, carbon capture utilisation and storage, professional and financial services, hydrogen and clean industries. Offshore wind is the single most important and immediate opportunity. Uh, yes, I will take one. Douglas Lumsden. I thank the uh, Deputy First Minister for taking the intervention. It's just around carbon capture, <coughs> utilisation and storage. Obviously, the, the Scottish Government announced £80 million of funding over two years ago. I think we've had clarification that £2 million is um, going to be coming imminently. Is there a time scale of when that £80 million will be, be spent? Deputy First Minister. Um, when it's required, of course, the, the member will know in terms of uh, CCUS that um, we've been waiting quite uh, a long time. Uh, I'm sure he has uh, an interest in seeing that progress as far as quickly as possible. We are uh, one of the best placed nations in Europe uh, to deploy CCUS due to our unrivalled access to vast CO2 storage potential in the North uh, Sea. But we do urgently need the UK government to make a final decision uh, about ACORN, uh, and that is the, the focus focus of uh, this government. And so, Presiding Officer, as I draw my comments to uh, a close, uh, in each of those five uh, priority areas, we have got uh, the infrastructure, the talent and skills, and enormous potential. And I appreciate that there will be slight differences of opinion across the chamber, which no doubt we will hear over the course of the debate this afternoon. Uh, but the point still stands that we have unprecedented opportunity in front of us if we take it. We cannot deliver all the benefits of net zero on its own. It's going to require hard work. We've been clear in the Green Industrial Strategy where we will focus our efforts, focus our attention, and we hold out the hand of welcome to any investor, any developer, and any business or any workforce that want to work with us in order to unlock the potential of those sectors and ultimately deliver prosperity to Scotland, prosperity with a purpose that will lead to resilient public services, tackle child poverty, and ultimately enable us to meet our net zero targets. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy First Minister. Could I please ask you to move the motion? Uh, moved. Thank you. Uh, I now call on uh, Douglas Lumsden to speak to and move Amendment 14431.2. Around eight minutes, please. Uh, th thank you, President Officer. And uh, I just want to start off by sharing our concerns about uh, the announcement on Grangemouth today and thoughts are with all the, the workers and, and families that we've actually relied on for, for decades to keep the, the lights on and, and to, keep us, uh, to keep the country moving. Uh, President Officer, this debate today was supposed to be about the programme for Government Growing Scotland's Green Economy, an opportunity to focus on what the Scottish Government has achieved or, or not achieved over the last 17 years and what they are planning to do to fix their mistakes over the next 18 months. 
Instead, today we've got a, a strategy document that was published yesterday that focuses on a narrow part of our net zero ambition and misses out a huge tranche of policy work that this Parliament should be discussing, in my view. We should be discussing the fact that this devolved SNP government have missed eight out of their 12 of their own net zero targets, that funding has been cut in key, area, in key areas that would help us achieve our net zero targets, key areas of policy that impact each and every one of us and our constituents. The Transport Net Zero and Just Transition budget was cut by £29.3 million. Rail Services budget cut by £80 million. Just Transition Fund by three quarters. Support for sustainable travel cut by 60 per cent. Yeah, I'll take the intervention. Ben McPherson. I, I just wondered in this uh, period of reflection that Mr Lumsden engaged in whether he would want to touch on the fact that the, the UK government subsidy change from rocks to contract for difference was removed at a key time for onshore wind, which could have helped the onshore wind industry to be even further ahead than it is right now. Dr Slamson. Uh, I'm sure there's been mistakes made in the past as a, a growing uh, industries came forward, and I'm, I'm sure that all governments would look back and potentially change how, how things were, were done. Um, the Future Transport Fund has been cut by 60 per cent. The Green Economy budget cut completely. Energy efficiency and decarbonisation budget cut by 9.3 million, and the energy transition budget cut by 33 million. So I can see why the Cabinet Secretary would rather not talk about that today. Of course. Deputy First Minister. I, I just wonder, I appreciate that Doug Thompson and his colleagues will probably have to go through it, sort of the excessive negativity about Scotland's economy, but can he rise to the, the, the opportunity that is being presented by our transition to net zero and reflect on the fact that inward investors seem to see something in Scotland that he doesn't, mm -hmm. considering this is the ninth year in a row where we have attracted the most uh, inward investment outside London? Dr. Uh, of course there's opportunities, and I'll, I'll come on to those opportunities, but we need to make sure we do that in the, the correct way. And I have concerns about uh, some, the impact on some communities that we will have, and I'll, I'll address that um, as, I go, as I go forward. So yesterday we saw this uh, strat new strategy. It would have actually been helpful to have that strategy out before, um, 24 hours before this debate. It would probably give us more time to digest it and go through it, uh, to have probably a, a better debate than uh, we may have uh, today. So this cements industries. Um, what I was going to say about the policy, it, it, has, it makes zero mention of our biggest energy industry, that of oil and gas. And this cements the industry concern that what the government is offering is a cliff edge in terms of transition. There is no just transition to green energy without the inclusion of our oil and gas sector. And while we continue to need oil and gas, we must work with the industry to produce it on these shores with high standards, lower transportation impact and costs, and supporting our local industries, businesses and communities. This strategy is a slap in the face to those industries, and the exclusion of our largest energy industry is quite simply a disgrace. The oil and gas sector is working tirelessly to move towards net zero, investing billions in technology and research to achieve these goals. These are committed to developing new industries, some of which are mentioned in this paper but recognises the need to ensure that while we need oil and gas, it's produced best on this shores. Yes, of course. Patrick Harvey. I'm grateful to the member for, for giving way. Just on a, a matter of, of pure fact, he, he talks about the investment the oil and gas industry is making tirelessly in the transition. Does he not acknowledge the fact that the oil and gas majors globally are still putting vastly more investment into more fossil fuel extraction than they are into renewables, and they've been described by the, the UN as making, at best, a marginal contribution to global investment in renewables. Dr. Slamson. Well, once again, Patrick Harvey seems to ignore the fact that much of the, much of the investment into renewables is actually coming from profits from oil and gas. If we switch off the oil and gas industry, those profits are not going to be generated. We're not going to have the transition that we all want. He's got his head in the sand once again uh, over this. Uh, President officer, I don't know who the Scottish Government thinks is going to invest in new, new in, um, energy technology of the future. You know, it, 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 it's not going to be the, the, the chocolate industry. It is going to be the oil and gas industry. We need them to invest, and I'm sure the Government uh, agrees with that. 93,000 jobs rely on the oil and gas sector. It is the biggest provider of energy in Scotland and one of our biggest industries and was not mentioned in this strategy document. Utterly shameful from this government who is intent on taking this industry off a cliff edge, failing to listen to their concerns, focused on the central belt and ignoring the needs of the North East. 
One thing that struck me in reading this strategy was the reliance on working with local government. And I would be interested in hearing from the Cabinet Secretary what discussions have been held with COSLA in the development of this strategy, particularly around the proposed changes to the planning system and the delivery of local development plans, a key area of work for our local authority colleagues. This strategy states that land will be identified for affordable housing, but there's no detail about what this will mean for local authorities. Perhaps it can be covered in the closing remarks. Of course. Deputy First Minister. Um, it's in, in, in good faith. Um, so a lot of this, these actions have actually come out of engagement with, you, with local government. So, for example, uh, when it comes to the, the planning hub or the uh, master plan consent areas, a lot of those ideas actually originated in the debates and discussions between Scottish Government and local government. So just to give some comfort on that, I probably need to do some follow-up work in terms of talking to them post-strategy publication. But... That's to give some comfort. Douglas Thompson. I thank the Deputy First Minister for that. That's, that's, that's very helpful. Um, there is much in this strategy, but I, I feel it's lacking in detail, lacking in targets, and misses so much. We would like to know when we are likely to see the energy strategy and just transition plan, the National Marine Plan, details on the circular economy bill that was framework legislation with little detail. And we want to know when carbon budgets are going to be brought forward and when EV charging points will be, be rolled out. I'd also like to have some more detail around hydrogen. Hopefully, hopefully Grangemouth will play a huge part in our hydrogen strategy going forward, especially after the news today. But I'd like to hear more about what we're going to do with the hydrogen when it's produced and in how. I often get frustrated to hear that we can export hydrogen to other countries, yeah. but I think we should be a bit more ambitious than that. Instead of exporting it to other countries to, for them to produce goods, of course. Evan Stewart. Um, thank you, President Officer, and thanks to Mr Lumsden for allowing the intervention. Uh, I agree uh, with uh, Mr Lumsden that uh, hydrogen shouldn't be only for export, uh, but one of the things that has held back uh, hydrogen production is the, was the inability of the last government to deal with storage and transportation regulations of hydrogen. I hope that the new Labour government will do something differently from the Tories. Would he agree with me? Douglas Thompson. I think any ways that we can try and improve the, the, the market for hydrogen would be a, be a good thing. But back to my point, though, I think if we are producing hydrogen, let's use it in this country to actually make things ourselves that, that then can be exported, not just actually export the hydrogen itself. Uh, and as for um, CCUS, obviously I made the intervention earlier, I'd like to have seen more detail around that. The SNP government did announce £80 million to support the Scottish Cluster more than two years ago. Um, very little has been spent, uh, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit disappointed about the, the lack of detail in this uh, strategy uh, around that. And of course, to deliver on an industrial strategy, we need to make sure that we have the, the correct infrastructure um, in place uh, around, around Scotland. You know, when will roads like the A9 and A96 be dualed, both key projects for the North East and lacking in any timetable de detail or budgetary considerations? Um, yesterday we debated ScotRail and the importance of rail as, as key to meeting our net zero targets when it comes to, to transport. And yes, this devolved SNP government is doing everything it can to push people off the trains yeah. and make them increasingly reliant on cars. Uh, the Scottish Conservatives continue to be the only voice in this Parliament sticking up for our oil and gas uh, sector, appreciating our vital place in our move to net zero and green energy. And we are committed to prioritising energy security through a balanced mix of energy sources that will ensure our energy security for decades to come. We want to see more people on our trains. And Mr. Lumsden, I appreciate that Mr. Lumsden has been extremely generous with taking so many interventions, but he will need to bring his remarks to close and move his amendment. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll come to a close soon. We support the development of uh, renewable te technologies to build Scotland as a powerhouse of renewable energies, but we want to do it in a way that takes communities with us and, and against the mass industrialisation of the North East. So in terms of the planning, we'll take obviously close look at what, uh, what changes um, will come on there. And of course, we back uh, nuclear. Uh, President officer, I move the amendment in my name. Thank you, Mr. Lumsden. I now call Sarah Boyack to speak to and move Amendment 14431.3. Around six minutes, please. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Uh, I start by moving the amendment in my name. Uh, I welcome the publication of the Green Industrial Strategy, but I would have welcomed it more enthusiastically if it had arrived sooner, if I and other colleagues never mind stakeholders, had actually been able to properly scrutinise the 
the report before today's debate. And I think it is worth reminding ministers that it was in 2001 when it was first announced in the programme for government. So we have been waiting a long time. And the points made by Douglas Lumsden, who I do not always agree with, were very accurate about the raft of cuts made by the SNP government that have, that have really impacted on making the progress that we urgently need being delayed. And we've got things like the Climate Change Adaptation Programme, the Energy Strategy, the Solar Vision for Scotland, the Sectoral Just Transition Plans. We need these as well because we need a joined up approach if we're going to deliver on climate change and we're going to deliver on the thousands of jobs we urgently need. If this report had come earlier, we could have got to work, um, but we're lagging behind. We're losing out on skills and resources while we've seen dither and delay from the Scottish Government. So if you actually look at what's in the Green Industrial Strategy, it still feels like a rush job, even though it's been hanging around for three years. And the Deputy First Minister mentioned the importance of a strategy for ensuring our education skills system is responsive to green economic priorities. But we still don't have that. Most of the plans outlined in the last Climate Emergency Skills Action Plan have never come to be, and the workers and our industries are still waiting for an offshore skills passport. Now, I attended an excellent Energy Efficiency Association conference yesterday, and it was absolutely striking the extent to which we simply don't have the skills for refitting our homes and buildings, making them energy efficient and more affordable to heat and power. And the lack of support for the supply chains was absolutely stark. That's crucial if we're going to decarbonise our homes and buildings. And the message that came across from all the businesses were there, they need that support now. because. We need more apprenticeships. We need more spaces in our colleges. But we don't just need them in a couple of cities. We need them right across the country, and we need them now. We need support for um, people who want to install solar heat and power systems, innovative battery storage and heating systems, and the fact that it was announced last week that Mitsubishi may cut 440 jobs in Livingston is due to a decline in product demand, and that is deeply worrying, given that that's one of the solutions. So we're not seeing the action in supply chains that's urgently needed. In the last few weeks, we've heard about the missed opportunities of the Scotland contract, um, but it's not just about extracting the money and spending it to support supply chains. It's a complete lack of conditionality with approvals, the lack of joined up thinking to see more renewables manufactured in Scotland, not just in recent years, but over the last 17 years. And I've had the privilege of seeing the work that's been done in the Port of Leith, um, which will give us homegrown supply chains, where the work that's been done for renewables being manufactured there, that is a huge opportunity. We can't afford to miss it. And it was good to see the work that's been done in Ardersir as well. So there are companies that are prepared to invest, but we need more support for manufacturing. We cannot just keep relying on imports for key components. Now, the problem with the Green Industrial Strategy is it's too vague, and we see the same work words peppered throughout the document, support, explore, consider, nice sounding words that bear little connection to actual action and implementation. We've had 17 years of warm words and that is not enough for a critical economic sector for our economy and to tackle our climate crisis. Yes, I will do. Deputy First Minister. Uh, the member sounds hauntingly like the, the, the Conservatives' negativity, and I'm relieved to hear some positivity about the Port of Leith and Ardisir. Um, just in terms of what the, the, the document includes, I mean, it's very action oriented. That will be inevitably one of the criticisms that we get that we don't name check every sector under the sun. But to her specific point, there are so many examples of where the Scottish supply chain is outperforming international competitors. And the question I put to the Conservatives is the question I put to her why do international investors? seem to disbelieve what the member is saying and they actually want to invest. No, I'm not saying we haven't had investment. I'm saying that whenever I meet people in the industry, whether it's from oil and glass, gas or where it's from renewables, supply chains are the number one issue they all mention, as well as getting more support for their workers. And we've got fantastic natural resources, we've got a wealth of skills, but we need to turn that into reality. GB Energy will be critical. Last week we saw a whole raft of new offshore wind farms approved across the UK. 
And we need to make sure that we get that investment coming to Scotland. Labour's National Wealth Fund is an ideal vehicle for investment in Scotland's ports. We've talked about this before. We need to get on with it. We, we could have a green supply chain infrastructure across the whole of Scotland, and that would give us thousands of new jobs. And people want to do this. We know from talking to workers in the oil and gas, they've got transferable skills that can still work in oil and gas, but also be brought into the renewable sector, especially in the offshore sector. And we've now got oil and gas companies who are going to be with us for decades that are also investing in renewables. So we've got that joined up approach is happening up the North East. We need more of it. But it needs a just transition, and we need to see action in the skills passport, because we could get going now. And the urgency of this is absolutely critical. We've already heard about other companies that are pulling out. We've heard about the Grangemouth announcement. The reforms to planning consenting, I welcome as a former planner, but there's not enough detail and not enough on a timeline. And the problem is we should have been doing this years ago because planners have left local authorities. Local authorities have been cut and we need more new planners to be able to deliver a speedier, effective planning process that works for our communities and for a renewable sector. So we need more we need more information on delivery. Warm words are not enough. If you look at the critique we've had from the Just Transition Commission, the Just Transition Partnership, the work that was done by the, for the STUC, um, there is research available that says more needs to be done. And I think the Transition Economics Report was clear. We need a massive ramp up in Scottish supply chains. So we need to have more work done here. We've had ambitious targets, they were supported across the parties, but we've not seen the ambition from government. And we've lost vital skills, we've seen lots of outsourcing of our industry and supply chains, and we've lost money that could have been raised and that could have been spent on more ambitious action. So we need a joined up approach. It is not just about producing energy, it's also about where we use it how we use it, whether we use it more effectively and use all the new innovations that are coming now, transport, building, land, ports, the energy system. We need to do better than this green industrial strategy, but we will be constructive. We will work with the Scottish Government because the alternative is more failure, more missed climate targets and workers losing jobs that have got skills and experience. Our communities, our workers, our businesses and our planet cannot afford that. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Boyack. And I now call on Lorna Slater to speak to and move Amendment 14431.1. Around six minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I move the amendment in my name. Most in this chamber will know my background in heavy engineering and renewable energy. As my register of interests indicates, I worked for Orbital Marine Power, building the world's most powerful tidal turbine until I was elected in 2021. The hull of this 72-metre-long, 680-tonne machine was fabrica fabricated in Cooper in Scotland with steel from Liberty Steel in Motherwell, and the turbine was assembled and launched at the port of Dundee. It currently operates in the fall of Warness off Ede in Orkney, generating clean, predictable power as the tides change direction four times a day. An earlier iteration of the orbital turbine was the first tidal turbine in the world to produce clean, green hydrogen energy, also in Orkney. I know firsthand the potential for manufacturing renewable energy and heavy and marine industries in Scotland, and I know the challenges the sector faces. Scotland needs a new vision for our economy that reinvigorates our manufacturing sector, creates jobs in growing low-carbon industries, and builds a skilled workforce. With the climate crisis upon us, we need to make a decisive turn away from oil and gas, phase out fossil fuels, and reduce energy demand by regulating to decarbonise homes and buildings. All of this opens up enormous opportunities. Offshore and onshore wind, green hydrogen, forestry and sustainable building materials, retrofit heat pumps and heat networks, solar power, tidal power, hydropower, and all the supply chain and maintenance contracts that support these growing industries. These are the specific industries that will create wealth for Scotland, jobs for people, and move us rapidly along our path to achieving net zero by 2045. Yet they are largely missing from the Scottish Government's green industrial strategy, whose vision for renewables focuses solely on the already successful wind sector. Green hydrogen 
is produced from water and electricity, both things that Scotland has in abundance. Green hydrogen is the ultimate in clean power. It can be generated off-grid, it's powerful and portable. It is the future power source for buses, tractors, HGVs and heavy industry. Producing hydrogen from fossil fuels, sometimes called blue and grey hydrogen, is at best a way to temporarily mitigate some of the emissions from hard to decarbonise industries. At worst, it's accelerating climate change by prolonging fossil fuel extraction and use. Yet the green industrial strategy doesn't differentiate. Green hydrogen, not fossil fuel hydrogen, is the future, and the Scottish Government should say so clearly in their industrial strategy. The green industrial strategy places a significant emphasis on carbon capture utilisation and storage, CCUS, presenting it as a core pillar of Scotland's green economy. Experts and campaigners, such as Friends of the Earth, argue that CCUS is a false solution as it prolongs the life of fossil fuel industrial complexes and distracts from the need to rapidly phase out carbon intensive industries. Carbon capture and storage is wildly expensive. It's also very energy intensive. If it works, it presents us with the prospect of paying for our energy twice, once when the oil and gas is extracted from the ground, and again when we try and pump the emissions produced back underground. Who's going to pay for that? That is not the route to cheap long-term energy. To date, CCUS has not been demonstrated to work at scale. The only possible place for it is in the temporary abatement of hard to decarbonize industries while those industries are phased out or changed over to sustainable power sources. CCUS is not a long-term or safe investment for our economy and public money should not be spent in supporting it. Public money would be better spent supporting people into engineering and skilled trades, supporting Scotland's engineering and manufacturing businesses to expand, upgrade their IT systems and machinery, invest in harbours, cranes and the infrastructure that heavy and marine industries need. Certainly. Sarah Boyack. I very much agree we need to see that infrastructure investment. Would the member also agree that we needed to see investment in solar, whether it's heat or power, and also wave and hydro, because there are other opportunities in addition to renewable wind that we should be seizing on now? Lorna Slater. Having worked in the wave industry, I might take that up with the member separately. But I, I absolutely understand that in putting forth a green industrial strategy, the government rightly should choose big industries to help us direct. Solar in Scotland is an important power source, but it's never going to be that big industry that we need to redirect. I would like to see more action and support for solar, but I can understand uh, why the Scottish Government is making a specific direction here. Um, support for solar, particularly in domestic settings uh, and in terms of you know, re remote and um, business decarbonisation is absolutely something we want to support. Public money uh, would, rather than through CCUS, would be better used in investing in public transport, building not only bus routes and train stations, but hydrogen-powered buses and trains. Go ahead. Douglas Lumsden, briefly, please. Well, I thank the member for taking the intervention. Just on um, CCUS, obviously we've got the uh, uh, Scottish cluster, so would, but does the member think that that should just be scrapped and all the jobs lost. Lorna Slater. Uh, public investment in particular is what I have a particular issue with. You talked yourself about the massive profits that oil and gas giants are making around the world. If oil and gas giants need to mitigate the harm that they are creating through their emissions, they can develop and invest in that technology. They've certainly got the money. Expecting the public purse, which we could be using to invest in schools, hospitals, and all those good things, to pay money to these industries, giants, to mitigate the harm that they are doing is not a reasonable course of action. I'm sorry, I need to make progress The, the member speech. will need to be moving to conclude um, her remarks. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It would have been good to see in the green industrial strategy a tie-in with an ambitious heat and building strategy. Creating demand in Scotland for heat pumps would support Scottish manufacturing like factories, factories like Mitsubishi and Electric who manufacture heat pumps. More than 430 workers in this factory face redundancy. Creating the conditions through regulation to increase demand for heat pumps would support Scottish manufacturers and save home owners on their energy bills and reduce emissions. 
I am disappointed and frustrated by the lack of a comprehensive plan to re-industrialise our economy and by the lack of a vision for seizing the opportunity Scotland has to leap ahead on our journey to net zero at the same time. Instead, we, what we appear to have is an attempt to string fossil fuel industries along whilst continuing on a trajectory to miss the 2045 net zero target. This green industrial strategy isn't anything new. It's a feeble attempt to keep up business as usual for as long as possible while failing on climate, failing to build industries with a long-term future. Ms. Slater, you will really need to conclude your remarks, please. Thank, thank you, Presiding Officer, and failing to take our economy in a new direction. Thank you. And I now call on Willie Rennie, around six minutes, please. Uh, towards the tail end of the summer, um, I agreed to, to visit the Sea Green uh, offshore wind farm uh, off the coast of Angus. Um, and as we sped over the choppy waters about 20 kilometres out, people were vomiting on either side of me. Um, it, was a, it was a joy to reach, eventually, the wind farm to meet Morris Golden, who was bouncing around on the boat, hard as nails, Morris Golden, who was with a massive smile on his face, watching everybody else suffer on the journey. Uh, but when we did get there, it, it was quite inspiring to see um, the wind farm. It was powering, and it is powering, 1.6 million homes. Quite a substantial amount of work that that's, uh, energy that that's creating. It created 400 jobs. It's now servicing with 80 jobs uh, from its base in, in Montrose. The disappointing bit is that most of the steelwork was done on the other side of the planet. And that's the missed opportunity because BIFAB and other facilities in Scotland missed out on being part of that great innovation of the coast of Angus. Yes, certainly. Deputy First Minister. Can I just thank the member for, I think, being one of the first to inject a bit of positivity that there are things that are working in Scotland, but to also agree with him on the principle that our assets essentially should create jobs here and not elsewhere and to also commend to him some of that early work that's going on. The whole point of the Green Industrial Strategy is to change that so that the next time we have something like that, the jobs are created in Scotland. And I would refer him to Flowcopter as an example of where the Scottish supply chain is completely disrupting the international market. Willie Rennie. She's so enthusiastic, I will send her out with Morris Golden on another trip uh, to the Sea Green offshore wind farm, see how she copes uh, with it. She might not be so enthusiastic next time. Um, but the really the, the hard thing for the people in Fife uh, and in Angus to take is that they are paying for that work off the coast uh, of Angus through their electricity bills, but they're not getting that economic benefit in their pockets. And that needs to change. And I'm pleased if the Minister is indicating that the new strategy is going to change all of that, then I think that will be a positive thing. And another positive thing I want to say is the Sumitomo plant up in Cromarty is a good step. But it is matched by so many other disinvestments. Mitsubishi is a real concern, especially when we've got so much of a focus uh, on heat pumps, BIFAB, which I've already uh, referred to, uh, and also, which has not been mentioned much, the shell disinvestment from the Scotland licence that they applied for earlier on this year. Uh, yes, briefly. Audrey Nicol. He may recall earlier on, uh, during FNQs, I asked, I think it was during FNQs or general questions, I asked a, a question in relation to uh, the issue around an almost 9% cut in our capital budget by the UK government. Does he agree with me that, given that we're talking about the importance of inward investment, that that cut must be re reversed? Willie Rennie. If we're going to get anywhere in this debate, we need to rise above this battle about whether it's Westminster's fault or Council's fault or anybody else's fault. We do need to focus on the steps and the powers that we've got in this Parliament to do things. And, I, and we can have a debate about capital. We can do that. And we can do that on another occasion, but I think this whole strategy was published to try and lift the debate and focus on what we can do in this Parliament. Because I'm afraid if we're talking about money, the, minister, the, the member needs to be careful, because all of the income from Scotland Round has now been spent on repairing the financial mismanagement of the SNP government. So the member should be careful if she enters into the debate about finances. Um, but I think on this particular day, 
With the, the decision at Grangemouth and my concerns about Liberty Steel, it does bring a sharp focus that is required to make sure that this green energy strategy, this green industrial strategy does work. Because these will not be jobs that are a bonus. These are jobs to replace the jobs that are being lost in other sectors. So we need to work incredibly hard to make sure this is a success or Scotland will not just lose out on the opportunity, but will actually be left with a massive legacy. So I welcome the strategy published. It is very high level. We need an awful lot more detail to make this work. And the essential elements for me are about making sure there's long-term continuity. Because I think we've seen with decisions that have been made by governments elsewhere that result in short-term changes in the rhetoric and the plans that creates uncertainty in the sector and that means the investors are less likely to make those essential long-term investments to make sure that we've got a success of this sector. But also the swift and efficient regulatory process. And there is huge concerns, especially because the Scotland round was so large that the regulatory process will not be able to cope with the massive number of applications, the volume and the timely processing of those applications will therefore be essential. We will need to encourage and give confidence to the sector to make sure that they do follow through with those licences that they have successfully achieved. And Berwick Bank is an example of that, and I know it's complicated, but we need to make sure that it meets the next contract for difference round because if it doesn't, that will strike a real blow into the confidence within the sector. And finally, on the Energy Efficiency Association, if it's OK briefly to mention that, the conference yesterday, there was one very important point they were making, and I hope the Minister can take it away with her colleagues, is that the, the latest round of area-based um, contracts for the insulation schemes have not been awarded. They were supposed to have been awarded earlier on this year, that is causing significant concern within the Energy Efficiency Association, especially because the sector is subject to constant stopping and starting of funding that's available through the industry or through government. So I hope the Minister will take that away and do something about it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Rennie. And we now move to the open debate. Backbench speeches of up to six minutes. I call Kevin Stewart to be followed by Edward Mountain. Mr Stewart. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. And I'm glad... Uh, that this motion opens with a simple statement and big ambition to grow the economy to eradicate child poverty. That's different from the austerity uh, and economic policies of the Tory government, which enriched uh, millionaire and billionaire pals. And it's different uh, from Labour's continued austerity, uh, which continues to impact on the poor, the frail and the elderly, as we've seen only the other week with the cuts to winter fuel payments. It's economic growth focused on generating the resources to lift children out of poverty. It's economic growth to go hand in hand with investing in our public services. It's economic growth to tackle the climate emergency and build the new green net zero economy. And at the heart uh, of the government's ambition is the need to invest in growing Scotland's green economy. And the green industrial strategy aims to maximise Scotland's wind economy, develop a self-sustaining carbon capture, utilisation and storage sector, support green economy professional and financial services, grow our hydrogen sector and establish Scotland as a competitive centre for the clean energy intensive industries of the future. Uh, this is in stark contrast uh, to Labour reneging on the £28 billion uh, of green investment that they once promised. Uh, and by abandoning uh, green investment in the net zero economy, it's clear that Labour's plan lacks realism 
and lacks ambition. I will give way to Mr Mara. Michael Mara. I, I appreciate the, the member given way. Does he recognise that we have already put through legislation to establish GB Energy in the UK Parliament, that £16 billion have been committed to this, this work, and that, that is critical to actually enabling the kind of investment that the Deputy First Minister is laying out today? Um, Kevin Stewart. President officer, none of us actually know what GB Energy is, because Labour have not spelled it out. Uh, and GB Energy... Uh, was promised to be headquartered in Aberdeen. Uh, there seems to be a shift away from that uh, as well. I hope that at some point in the very near future that Labour ministers actually spell out what GB Energy is for uh, and that they will uh, actually live up to their promise and base GB Energy uh, in Aberdeen. Um, President officer, su support for oil and gas uh, in a net zero economy isn't support for the old economy, it's very much support for the new economy. Because let us be clear, oil and gas will be at the heart of the shift to the new green economy. People may be moving to driving electric uh, and hydrogen cars, but those cars will uh, be largely made of plastic from oil and gas, and they will drive on roads made of tar from oil and gas. And it's not just transport. Petrochemicals are necessary to provide vital goods, from the clothes in our backs uh, to the medicines in our prescriptions. Uh, and uh, the Grange Mines announcement today is worrying, uh, and I wish Michelle Thompson well in her work to secure a new owner uh, for uh, Grangemouth, because without a home oil and gas industry, we'll simply be left importing everything from abroad. And I'm sure that's something that none of us uh, want uh, to see. Uh, and we cannot allow Westminster to re repeat the policy of Thatcher, who destroyed Scotland's steel industry, and have the same thing happen to our energy industry. The future of energy production uh, in Scotland is 100% renewable, and it is vital that Scotland's oil and gas sector transitions to renewable energy production. At the core of this will be our oil and gas workers. Um, our oil and gas workers, who are the folk with the skills and the talents to turn our hopes of a net zero future into a reality. They are the ones who can lay the foundations for wind farms miles offshore uh, and who can scale to the top of wind turbines to repair them. But workers need work, not just work today and work in the future, but continued work throughout. And at the heart of that just transition and building a green economy, we have to ensure that workers move seamlessly from the oil and gas sector to good jobs and renewables. And that's why I'm pleased the, to see the core commitments uh, in the Scottish Government's green industrial stra strategy to support people to retrain, to enhancing the transferab transferability of scale skills and to encourage employers to invest in training. Our offshore workers must not suffer the same fate under Labour rule from London as our miners suffered under Tory rule from London. And just this week, the TUC voted against Labour's plans and insisted that a comprehensive strategy is developed to ensure that all workers in the North Sea have equivalent uh, employment opportunities. It is absolutely vital that we get this right, not only for Aberdeen, the oil and gas capital of Europe, who I hope uh, will uh, be the renewables capital of the world, but we need to get this right for the whole of Scotland. Scotland's renewable energy sectors is one of the greatest export Mr. Stewart, opportunities you will need to conclude. we will ever have for our country. We must grasp that. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you, Mr Stewart. I now call Edward Mountain to be followed by Michelle Thompson. Mr Mountain. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And I'd like to start my uh, speech by giving Kate Forbes, the Deputy First Minister, an abject apology that I haven't had a chance to look at the Green Industrial Strategy. It only arrived yesterday with me, 
and I would have liked more time, but as you will well know, uh, the climate change bill that's landed in front of the committee that I'm on is taking up a considerable amount of my time. So I've only skimmed it, so I apologise for that. Um, but what I did skim on the first page was a requirement for maximising Scotland's wind energy. And I want to drill that down to how it affects the Highlands. Now, what it says uh, in the uh, strategy as for, and what the government's plan is to in, increase the onshore wind farms from 8.8 gigawatts to 20 gigawatts. That's a huge increase, a massive increase. Much of that's going to be faced and placed in the Highlands. And just to remind the Deputy First Minister, who also represents a constituency in that area, there are 49 onshore wind farms scattered across the Highlands, quite randomly, with 840-odd turbines. And so I'm sure she knows there's 41 uh, applications in scoping, uh, 23 applications in planning, there's 28 have, that have been approved and 8 that are under construction. If you add all that up, uh, Deputy First Minister, you'll come up with uh, 100 new wind farms to go up in the Highlands. That's probably another 2,000 turbines dotted around our landscape. Now, I'm going to ask you to part that at this stage and just move on to the infrastructure that's going to support that. <clears throat> SSEN has a big policy of uh, investing £20 billion, laying 800, uh, sorry, 1,800 kilometres of new lines, of which 500 kilometres will be over parts of the Highlands. There will be some underwater. Now, that doesn't sound much, but let's put that into context, if I may. As the F Deputy First Minister drives down the A9, to come to work, as I do, at the beginning of the week. She sees the Bewley to Denny power line. That's one line. I'm told reliably that, that we will need another three to develop this strategy. Oh, yeah. If I can just finish the bit I'm going on on that. So that's three. That's making four lines. You probably won't be able to see much of the Cairngorms as you go past through, turbo, uh, through um, towers and lines. And dotted on top of that, we have battery storage uh, facilities, which I'm reliably told are now called grid balancing facilities because that sounds more reasonable, dotted across the highlands. In fact, the last one I saw was over 80 acres in size. Uh, Presiding officer, I'll give way to the Deputy First Minister. Deputy First Minister. So, so just where I do uh, agree with um, Edward Mountain is the importance for communities not just to put up with the disruption but to get benefit as well. Uh, the second thing is obviously to focus very much on uh, offshore wind uh, as well in terms of generating that. But the third thing is an area I hope he will agree with me on uh, is that actually uh, uh, the transmission work is uh, determined by Ofgem. Uh, that is reserved uh, to the UK government. So whilst there is domestic generation through Scottish government planning, uh, the, the electricity and the grid is reserved. And so just to make clear to communities listening, you know, I think all parties have a stake in that and it can't just be put at the front door of the Scottish Government. Edward Mountain. Absolutely, and I, I don't blame the Scottish Government for that at all. I just make the observation that SSEN has a map which they won't disclose to us at the moment, which shows every single power line they need to reach the 2045 target, every single connection that they're proposing across Scotland. And perhaps it would be better to display that to communities rather than pretending it's all down to Ofgem. They know what they need. Ofgem will give them the authority to do it, but SSEN ought to be more open. So we have these large bits of infrastructure being dotted over the Highlands, and there doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason just to connect wind farms. And those bits of infrastructure will create new jobs. I don't, I don't dispute that. But those jobs are very transient. They are not going to actually make much difference to local communities, local communities who are being promised all sorts of things like new village halls. And there's only a certain amount of new village halls that you can build on the back of wind farms. There's only a certain amount of village halls that you can paint on the back of wind farms. They need to deliver a lot more. They need to actually feel the benefit of these wind farms, in my opinion. They need to see that there's something's coming to them. And I totally disagree that a one-off payment of 5%, say, of, of the capital value of the wind farm is enough. We need to see these, these communities who are going to be blighted by all of this infrastructure, not just seeing the power going south, but actually getting cheap power, getting some benefit 
from this infrastructure dotted around. Now, I'm just going to say before I close, and I'm conscious of the time, presiding officer, I'm hugely, hugely disappointed with this Scottish Government. £750 million from Scotland promised to the net zero and improving uh, our uh, ability to cope with net zero. They've spent it. They frittered it away. And it is this Scottish Government that spent so much of the Parliament saying, if only we'd had a sovereign wealth fund because of the oil that we've got. We had a sovereign wealth fund in the form of Scott Wind, and we've spent it. We've not just spent uh, the, the money, the income that coming from it, but also the capital. So, Presiding Officer, I would just say, when the, when the Deputy First Minister is going through the Green Industrial Strategy, Remember, in many cases, it will be the highlands that put up with the infrastructure that are littered with the turbines, that are littered with the power lines. And you're going to have to come up with a strategy to make sure that those people who live up there benefit from it and don't just have to see it. Thank you, presiding officer. Thank you, uh, Mr. Boynton. I now call Michelle Thompson to be followed by Richard Leonard. Ms. Thompson. Ah, thank you, presiding officer. Um, I'll just make a few short remarks so the presiding officer can be sure that I intend to come in well under the time allocated. I welcome this initiative and would like in my short remarks today just to make a few points, but I can't speak today without referencing the Grangemouth refinery basin in my constituency. I appreciate and understand that there's a long road to travel to try and get a positive outcome, and I simply note that I, as a constituency MSP, will play my part. Firstly, I welcome point five of the Green Industrial Strategy, in particular calling Scotland to become a centre for clean energy and intensive industries of the future. I have always been ambitious for Scotland, and I am heartened to see us focus in areas where we can compete at global level. I am particularly pleased to note the prominent role for Grangemouth, albeit there is considerable uncertainty at the moment, as it states a key is utilising our existing industrial assets, such as our port infrastructure, new green free ports and Grangemouth. I am also personally pleased to note the prominence given to the development of the hydrogen sector, not least as it is my belief this is an area where Grangemouth has the potential to play a major role. The importance of innovation is recognised as critical, and in this regard, partnering with Scotland's university, Scottish business and the investment community will be key. Now, I know the Deputy First Minister understands the crucial role our academic community can add, and the return on investment can add real value as well as positioning us for where we want to be. And since my election, I have spent time engaging with many of Scotland's universities, in particular to relation to their research, and I add my voice to others that commended the work of Dundee universities. And their life sciences recently, so I am pleased to see the role of our universities as recognised in the strategy. However, I would like to see the retention of more commercialised research in Scotland. I think that is important. The emphasis in partnership working is, of course, a fundamental. The government alone simply cannot fund all of the investment required. We require to unlock the huge potential investment from business investors and alike. And this will require strengthening the culture of partnership working where government uses its convening power and financial heft we are required. And I give my now habitual reminder re regarding the scale of investment needed globally. Although estimates vary, they are all counted in the trillions of pounds annually. And as recently as March this year, the Scottish Fiscal Commission indicated the Scottish Government needed to spend £1.1 billion on average every year into the future at current prices. But one of the most telling con conclusions of the Scottish Fiscal Commission analysis was, and I quote, the fiscal burden of reaching the UK's net zero target may fall disproportionately on the Scottish Government because a greater share of the UK reduction in emissions relating to forestry and land use needs to take place in Scotland. So it makes clear that the mechanism of Barnet consequentials won't be enough. And this same document points out that the UK cannot and will not reach its net zero targets without Scotland. I know this is a matter dear to the heart of the Deputy First Minister, but we need to ensure that our investment not only supports the growth and scale-up of existing businesses, but also supports the creation of new businesses, entrepreneurs and innovators. My own particular wish that women entrepreneurs and business owners take a fair seat at the table is something I will continue to progress, and I know that wish is shared by many in this chamber. My final point is on housing. 
we need to build far more net zero homes. Now, whilst I welcome the increase in expenditure for housing, the recent programme for government, I need to believe we need to be doing much, much more. I'd also note the challenge around retrofitting existing housing stock where there are no easy answers. So I welcome the efforts to court institutional investors and to rebuild relationships with the developers. But the challenge for us all is significant. Thank you. Thank you. I now call Richard Leonard to be followed by Bob Doris uh, in six minutes. Mr Leonard. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. It's long been my view that if we are to rise to the challenge of the climate emergency, we need to think big and act radical. It has also long been my view that the Scottish Government is flat and pedestrian when we need passion, conviction and, above all else, a sense of urgency. This is not just about legislation. It is about leadership. And I have to say this, after 17 years in office and over five years after the climate emergency was declared at the SNP conference, it is astonishing that the SNP government has finally only yesterday got round to publishing a green industrial strategy. Focused on five so-called opportunity areas, I'm perplexed that the government limits its horizons in this way. Shouldn't every job be a green job? Shouldn't the whole economy be a green economy? Where is the ambition? And there are other elements of the strategy too, which I think we must debate. The Scottish Government's continued over-reliance on foreign direct investment means there is no redistribution of power and wealth in the economy, green or otherwise. In fact, what we are witnessing is a growing concentration of wealth and power in the economy. Nearly two out of three workers employed by Scotland's larger businesses already work for companies owned either from the rest of the UK or increasingly from overseas. And yet, with this latest strategy, what the government is growing is not a green economy, but a branch plant economy. And this has consequences. This steady erosion of decision-making from the Scottish economy has consequences. Just ask the workers at the Grangemouth oil refinery. This imbalance of power leaves these workers and their families, leaves this strategic national asset at the mercy of a billionaire tax exile and an overseas government. And despite the green industrial strategy talking about investing in strong R&D foundations, when it comes to business research and development, we are seventh out of 12 UK nations and regions, eighth as measured by employment generation, a consequence again of being a largely subsidiary economy. In the 1990s, I used to visit the oil rig fabrication yards at Nig Bay and Ardesia. Back then, they were owned by Brown and Root, Halliburton, and McDermott's, both global corporations both, as it happens, headquartered in Texas, in Houston. Today, the government, in its programme, and the First Minister this afternoon, and the Deputy First Minister, talks about the redevelopment of these sites. And, of course, we all want to see the redevelopment of these sites. We all want to see new life and new jobs in renewable energy as part of a just transition. But we can't ignore the fact that Nig Bay is being developed by a corporation headquartered in Japan, and Ardesia is being redeveloped by a company which is owned and controlled by the Quantum Capital Group, again headquartered in Houston, Texas. And that will make them vulnerable to decisions in faraway boardrooms. And we will see all the wealth and all the profits being exported. In the programme for government, we also read of the work of the Scottish National Investment Bank. They have, we are told, avoided, reduced or removed 52,841 tonnes of CO2 equivalent. And how was this done? Well, we know that one of the principal ways has been through a £50 million investment in Gresham House, which is now, incidentally, owned by a US private equity firm. The business of Gresham House is not to plant trees or to recover peatland. That's a by-product. Its real business model is to help the wealthy avoid paying their fair share of tax on inheritance and capital gains. Just look as well 
at who won the Scotland licences awarded by the Scottish Government. Italian, Swedish, Belgian companies, Spanish, French, German utilities, Norwegian, Dutch, Australian corporations, some of them public, but most of them privately owned. Licences all given away at a knockdown price. So if there is any colonising going on, and I know some people in the SNP like to talk in these terms, we are being colonised by multinational corporations, global capital and financial markets. And as we have learned, the proceeds of Scotland aren't being used to support a just transition or indigenous business development. Our supply chains, our manufacturing base are not being invested in sufficiently. These funds are being used simply to pay for Scottish Government day-to-day -day expenditure. Even the Community Wealth Building Bill is signalled in this programme for government as a matter for local government, when we all know that if we are to see transformative change, it must be a matter for the Scottish Government, for national government agencies, the Scottish National Investment Bank, for public sector pension funds. It requires a boost to agencies like Cooperative Development Scotland. We can grow Scotland's green economy, but if it is in the same hands as the existing economy, with the same distribution and concentration of power and the same gross inequalities which arise from that, then in my view we will have failed. It's high time we had economic as well as political democracy. It's high time we steered a different economic path. It's high time we did think big and act radical. Thank you very much. I now call Bob Doris to be followed by Maurice Golden around six minutes. Mr Doris. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Um, I'm pleased to speak in this afternoon's debate on growing Scotland's green economy. I had a slightly different tack from some of my colleagues. I mentioned the green industrial strategy in the First Minister's questions this morning. And in doing so, I referenced a section, a very small section actually, within the strategy which looks at the construction sector, given its role within carbon emissions and a very real need to make the sector less carbon intensive. I was encouraged to hear from the First Minister that there has been a clear and substantial engagement with this vital sector, not only because of the importance in reducing emissions on our journey to net zero, but also because our construction sector is fundamental at ensuring we all have a warm, damp-free, energy-efficient home to stay in. Tackling housing need and fuel poverty and tackling our climate challenges must go hand in hand. For many of my constituents, that is vital. That will resonate more than talking about the green economy, but they go hand in hand. I was pleased, therefore, to see within the Green Industrial Strategy a reiteration of the Scottish Government commitment to deliver our ambitious ambition for 110,000 affordable energy efficient homes by 2032. And I would note, uh, as a city boy, that 10 per cent of those were to be in remote and rural island communities, which is important given the unique challenges that they have. But I also want to mention other things that were contained in relation to the construction uh, and built environment sector within uh, the Green Industrial Strategy. It spoke about exploring the potential and the impact of modern methods of construction in rural and island contexts including working with BEST Innovation Centre that supports and provides practical assistance with solutions that advance delivery of a zero carbon built environment. I see the Minister Alistair Allen sitting there. He often talks about the, the huge challenges that his constituents have in uh, heating their homes, let alone getting to net zero. So that BEST uh, innovation will be vital. It also mentions reform and modernised compulsory purchase legislation in Scotland and the case for compulsory sale orders. I hope we swiftly deliver on both, Deputy First Minister. It talks about supporting collaborative and place-based approaches to identify land for affordable housing, working closely with regional economic partnerships and communities. I suppose what I'm trying to do, President Officer, is make sure that the construction sector is not squeezed out in the discussion on a green economy. CITB, for example, estimates that in 2021, 230,000 people were employed by that construction sector. In 2022, £13.3 billion was generated by that sector, and £4 billion of that, according to the Charter of Building, came 
from public sector investment. So construction matters. But I also want to put on record, construction doesn't just mean building homes. It is that wider energy generation to deliver net zero. So, for example, I would, I would note uh, SSE's 4.1 gigabyte Berwick Banks offshore wind farm, Cerulean wind plans for three floating wind turbine projects, and the 2 gigawatt west of Orkney wind farm, all within uh, a report uh, which says there is a good 10-year pipeline in relation to construction within that sector. But CITB uh, notes and warn that there is an additional need for 3,910 people to be, replete, to, to be sourced every single year, more workers to meet the demand of the sector and to deal with the churn of employment within the sector. So that is a challenge that Scotland's green economy has to tackle. And we are happy to hear in the summing up what the Scottish Government is doing to tackle those challenges. Now, the Scottish Housing uh, Condition Survey uh, is very clear that the private rented sector has the highest uh, emissions in relation to uh, energy efficiency, but also in terms of the quality housing standard, where 60 per cent, 60 per cent of the private rented sector do not meet those housing quality standards, and 35 per cent of that is below the tolerable standard. That is something that is tackled on an industrial scale, and that is something that the green economy and green industry should be tackling. Mr Rennie spoke about area-based uh, energy efficiency schemes such as like, uh, in insula insulation measures. And I would note that in, since 2013, £433 million has been spent by this government to tackle that with 100,000 households and hundreds of local communities benefiting. That is an industry. That is the green economy. Let us not squeeze it out in these debates. I think that is really important. But finally, and, and I will say this in a non-partisan way, capital budgets do matter. We can have a debate in this place about whether our Scottish Government is deploying them as the parties in this place would see fit. But we do know there have been swinging cuts to Scotland's capital budget, and that really matters when we try to reach net zero. And we need cross-party, non-partisan support to challenge the current UK Government to tackle those swinging capital cuts to Scotland. And likewise, we know the revenue budgets to this place have been deeply undermined by the previous UK Government and the current one because of inflation, because of real-term cuts. I won't rehearse all the arguments. Uh, Mr Limson, I apologise. I'm just coming to a, a conclusion. The point I'm making, President Officer, let's maximise the revenue to this place. Let's maximise our investment in our green economy, and let's not undermine our ability to work together on a cross-party basis to do that. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you. I now call Maurice Golden to be followed by Ben McPherson. Around six minutes, Mr. Golden. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And let me begin today on a positive note by agreeing with the First Minister. In his programme for government statement last week, he said that the policies he announced, and I quote will be rendered ineffective if we do not also address the greatest existential threat of our times. We must take effective action to tackle the twin crises of climate change and biodiversity loss." End of quote. That the First Minister recognises this is to be welcomed, just as I have always welcomed the ambition shown by the Scottish Government in setting a high bar for climate action. But, as I said in last week's debate on the UN's Declaration for Future Generations, ambition is nothing without delivering results. So, I am hoping ministers in closing use this opportunity to set out more detail than we got in the programme for government and subsequent green industrial strategy. There is much to be welcomed in this, but it is very high level. One area already mentioned today concerns transition plans. We are told there will be plans for transport, agriculture and land use in the built environment and construction. What we aren't told is when they will be published. The same goes for the already delayed energy strategy and just transition plan that will be especially important for the future of the North East region. Then there is also the continued uncertainty around the next climate change plan. I appreciate the Climate Change Emission Reductions Targets Bill, 
will set out the timetable for the new plan, but it would be useful both if ministers could confirm today that the draft plan will be presented by summer. Otherwise, we risk running out of time for proper scrutiny and amendments before the 2026 election. Well, happy to. Bob Doris. Just, uh, uh, I thank Morris Golden for giving me, but Morris Golden recognised that the Climate Change Committee of the UK, the Climate Change Committee said that they would recommend that the Scottish Government does not set those draft plans until they have reported in the UK position roughly around March or so next year. Morris Golden. Well, I, th I think the point is we should have had a climate change plan already, but I, given where we are today, then I think the timetable I set out by summer fits well with the point that the member has made. But let me turn to some areas of the green economy not already mentioned today. The first of these concerns aquaculture. Scotland has great potential here, particularly regarding seaweed as a resource that can deliver benefits for our coastal communities. But we need to see an appropriate regulatory framework, and this was supposed to be delivered by early 2023. So it would be useful to hear what progress is being made on this. I also want to raise the issue of spatial management. As ministers will know, there is increased competition for access to our inshore waters, such as from fisheries and renewables. It is an issue that is regularly raised by the fishing industry, and it would be useful to hear from ministers whether the National Marine Plan 2 that was mentioned in the programme for government will introduce a coherent system of spatial planning to ensure sustainable use of our seas. Deputy Presiding Officer, on these issues and, and many more, there is an urgent need for more detail. How can we expect the public or business to lend their support or invest their money in policies for a green economy if they are unsure as to whether this government can deliver? Because whether the Scottish Government likes it or not, their rhetoric often does not match their actions. This creates uncertainty. By now, we are all familiar with the list of environmental failures from this SNP government. Everything from missing the emissions targets to an astonishing nine times in the past 13 years to failing more than half their international biodiversity targets to having still not delivered their 2013 household recycling target, that's more than a decade late now. And the divergence from what they say and what they do is only going to get worse. In the programme for government, the SNP claim that they will continue to lead on climate action internationally. But not only have they abandoned the key 2030 net zero target, but they also hid their failure for seven months before finally having to admit they were off track. Or when they say they are committed to delivering a circular economy, but have already watered down the circular economy bill and largely limited discussion in the programme for government to waste and litter regulations. Or when they talk about a green economy at all, after having drastically making cuts to funding which has meant the support the which is meant to support the transition to a more sustainable economy. Just look at the budgets they have cut in the past two weeks. Nature restoration, energy efficiency and decarbonisation, the Just Transition Fund, sustainable travel and, of course, the net zero and energy budget itself. So I say it is great the First Minister recognises the need to act. Now he needs to recognise that a green economy cannot be built on false promises and budget cuts. Thank you. And I call the final speaker in the open debate, Ben McPherson, around six minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer. And first of all, I just want to associate myself with the remarks made by the, the First Minister, party leaders and members who represent the Grangemouth refinery on today's really significant news. And my thoughts are also with all the workers uh, and the people involved in the refinery's operation throughout the fourth estuary and the, the, the wider effect on the economy, which have of course, I represent part of. This is a significant development in a situation where overall in this space 
in terms of both Scotland's capacity and history for issues of energy and electricity production, we have a, a really positive story, and also in terms of where we have been in recent years. And I do think it is important to recognise at this point, in terms of growing the green economy and the production of particularly renewable electricity, what a remarkable journey Scotland has been on. For example, the operational capacity for renewable electricity generation, it is my understanding, was in 2010 4.4 gigawatts. In March this year, this was 15.4 gigawatts. With projects in the pipeline, we have over three times more of that capacity to be realised just in what is envisaged ahead of us. People often talk, as Kevin Stewart did, about the, the impact in terms of that has in terms of energy demand. But also, if you just think of that capacity that I've mentioned and the huge progress that's been made, it is absolutely in no doubt that Scotland's green economy development has been a huge success. And if we think about that in the time period that we've been in, austerity from 2010, a UK government choice, Brexit, a development that has negatively impacted the UK economy, undoubtedly, a pandemic that was unpredictable and affected us all in the, in the uh, really uh, negative ways that it did. You know, all the cost of living crisis, impact of global issues like the war in Ukraine. And through all of that, Scotland's renewable energy has increased and its green economy has strengthened. For me, this is most, uh, most demonstrated in the, the recent story of the Port of Leith. If you think back to around about the time of 20. 10, just before that, before the financial cri uh, crisis, the, the proposals for the Port of Leith was to drain the port, turn it into residential development for people working in the financial sector. And when we had the banking crisis, those plans changed dramatically. Now the plans for the Port of Leith, backed by inward investment, patient capital, is to create one of the biggest renewable energy hubs in Europe, with £50 million of investment, something that I strongly support. And this is looking uh, very uh, in a good position as things stand, and there is a very exciting proposal for Vestas, the huge Danish wind manufacturer, to build potentially Europe's biggest offshore wind manufacturing production plant in the Port of Leith, something that I am working to, to strongly support and I am really grateful that the Government is engaged in, in this proposal. I, I, I should say at this point, as others have as well, the, the Berwick Bank development is connected to this and um, I, I have raised the issue of consenting times uh, previously in Parliament. That is on the record and that is why I warmly welcome I strongly welcome the, the planning hub proposals in the programme for government. I think that is an important step forward. But I also think colleagues should remember that the, the concerns uh, that have been raised by RSPB with regard to Berwick Bank relate to the biodiversity challenge that we face. So um, if we are going to have passion for increasing our renewable energy production and also protecting biodiversity, sometimes these things I have to be uh, mutually uh, considered. Sarah Boyack. Can I thank the member for taking intervention? I think it's an excellent point. And that issue about making sure that when we do renewables, we also do biodiversity and tackle the nature crisis is key. And wouldn't sharing best practice and experience, given the decades of experience we've got, really help move that on in terms of what works best for both animals, birds, and our natural environment, as well as getting renewables going? Ben McPherson. I, I, I'm, I'm simply saying that uh, I think in, in this situation, obviously I can't speak on individual applications because I'm not close enough to the detail, but I would envisage that there's, a, there's an important balance of consideration that's being undertaken with regard to, the, to that proposal at Berwick Bank. Um, but I, 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 I really strongly support what that could unlock in the Port of Leith in terms of the Vestas proposals. And 
whether it is in the Port of Leith and, and more widely, uh, but particularly I can speak from, from my constituency, the, the skills that will be required in order to meet the demands of these new opportunities really do matter. And that is why I welcome the post-school education reform bill, uh, having considered these matters on the Education Committee with others in the Chamber today. I do think we really need to, to press ahead in order to make sure that uh, our young people can benefit from these huge opportunities and these brilliant companies and proposals that are, are being taken forward in our country can be realised through the, the hard work and talent of our people. Thank you very much. We now move to closing speeches. I call first Patrick Harvey. Uh, around six minutes, please. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. The, um, the Government motion refers to concrete actions to accelerate the transition. Uh, that is certainly a description of what is needed from a green industrial strategy. Sadly, in my view, it is also a description of what is missing from the green industrial strategy. I do not intend to focus too much on the, um, the kind of fundamental economic differences that we have. Uh, Greens, in particular, have a critique uh, of the the predilection on economic growth as a, an end in itself. Uh, there is, for us, a direct uh, conflict between growth and sustainability uh, as objectives in an economy. But the, the fact that the, industrial strategy, the green industrial strategy emphasises growth over sustainability isn't a great surprise, given that this is the fundamental difference, not just between Greens and the SNP, but between Greens and every other party in the chamber. The thing is, though, even from that perspective, even from the perspective that sees green industry as an alternative way of delivering growth in an economy uh, as polluting industries decline, this strategy is lacking because fundamentally it offers no clear path away from fossil fuel industries, from the dirty, polluting industries uh, of the dying economy. I think the emphasis on carbon capture, utilisation, storage and on fossil hydrogen uh, really emphasise this, uh, this problem for me. Both of these technologies, if they were to come to pass, if they deliver on the scale that the Scottish Government clearly has in mind for them, they lock us in. They lock us in to our over-reliance uh, on a fossil fuel economy, on the, on the ongoing extraction of fossil fuels. And for those who uh, occasionally, I think somebody uh, during the debate, I'm afraid I, I, I apologise, have forgotten, who made the point that uh, plastics and paints and, and other chemical feedstocks uh, also come from hydrocarbons, the idea that those hydrocarbons are going to continue to be extracted if we stop using them for energy and only use them for the other purposes, uh, that simply uh, isn't a, a viable proposition. And I don't think you'd find an oil and gas major in the world that would accept the idea that they carry on investing in extracting hydrocarbons without being able to use them as fuel. Grangemouth is a very, very clear example of the vulnerability, the precarity that our economy has through overexposure uh, to fossil fuel and over-reliance on fossil fuel. Uh, people across the chamber have spoken about our concern about the, the community and the workforce and their families who are now left high and dry without a clear proposition of how a just transition will be brought about. But they're far from the only community who have been in that position. I would make the comparison with Longana. Uh, you know, going back more than, a, more than a decade before now, people had known for years that Scotland's last coal-fired power station was going to close, would close, must close, should close, had to close if we were going to have any chance at all of reducing our carbon emissions. They'd known that for years, and yet the Scottish Government, the local government, the owners, and sad to say even the union at the time, just kept on saying, we're fully committed to the long-term future of this plant. What should have happened, if we were serious about a just transition, is that the last 10 years of the operation of that plant should have been dedicated to investment in what the community needed when it closed. And sadly, what we got instead was uh, that full commitment to its long-term future until the date was announced for its closure. And then let's set up a task force. And that's exactly what we're seeing again right now. 
Now, it's not a direct comparison because there are other ways that we could repurpose the Grangemouth plant. It's not a question of closure having been uh, a clear expectation, but the need for a just transition has been a clear expectation for years, and yet it is utterly lacking, not just in relation to Grangemouth, but any detailed just transition plan in relation to other communities that depend on it, utterly lacking from the green industrial strategy. Other things uh, are missing as well. Demand reduction has been mentioned, I think, in relation to heat in buildings uh, by my colleague Lorna Slater, I think by uh, Sarah Boyack and, and one or two others as well. Uh, and um, I think it's worth acknowledging that the, the jobs at risk in Mitsubishi and Livingston, uh, that relates principally to a decline in the export market. Uh, Mitsubishi has been exporting heat pumps to other European countries uh, and that demand has not kept pace with expectations. They have invested in production for domestic demand and if the UK and Scottish governments can work together to find a solution that, that protects those jobs, uh, I wish them well. But the long-term viability of the incredible opportunity that the Heat and Buildings Programme gives us is only going to be realised if the government has the political will to face down the critics on its own backbenches and regulate with great ambition to say that we're serious about that heat in buildings agenda. That's what will create the conditions for investment in skills, in capacity, in supply chain and in innovation that's already happening. But demand uh, reduction needs to relate to resources as well as energy. The, uh, the potential for repair and reuse skills being an important part of a circular economy. That needs to be part of our approach. Uh, and finally, presiding officer, nothing on ownership decentralisation uh, and the risks of financialisation. I saw uh, some people uh, slightly turning their nose up when Richard Leonard was making some very important and serious points about this. I don't want to swap a bunch of multinational fossil fuel companies for a bunch of multinational renewable companies. I want this agenda to be ushering in a new economy, one that is fundamentally more equal and that doesn't allow the wealth that needs to be invested in the green transition to be hoarded by a few billionaire tax exiles. Thank you. I now call Michael Mara around six minutes. Mr Mara. Thank you, President Officer. Scottish Labour welcomes the publication of this long-promised uh, and oft-delayed industrial strategy um, I promised at the start of this parliamentary term, of course, because we are in a global race to compete in renewable energies, and other countries have not been wasting the time like the Scottish Government has been. With every year that passes, it does become less likely that we can become world leaders in any of these industries. And I think some of that imperative is highlighted uh, in the document, particularly where to seize the opportunities about floating offshore wind. Um, Sarah Boyack also pointed out the plethora of other key policy documents that have been long delayed by this government, upon which industry and investment relies, and I can hope we can see some of them soon and perhaps with a little bit more notice, as members have pointed out. But delays have been a common theme um, throughout the debate today, uh, critically in permitting some of these developments. And I thought Ben McPherson set out some of those challenges and opportunities um, very well. And the Minister rightly cites how, uh, uh, their own restrictions in terms of what they can say regarding these uh, significant applications that are in place, but it does not negate the fact that they are taking far, far too long to be dealt with. And the Minister should, I hope, be reflecting in terms of the implementation plan around the strategy, what we can do, whether it be in legal terms as well as resource terms, to make sure that that happens. Because the SNP have failed to live up to the promises that they have made in this area. A decade ago, the Scottish Government wanted us to be the green energy capital of Europe, signed off, sir, with around 28,000 jobs in offshore wind alone. By 2021, we had an estimated 3,100 full-time jobs in offshore wind. They were lofty aims, but this Government's failure to give a strategic direction to industry for a decade means that we have too often been idling while other countries have pulled ahead. And the reality of the value chain investment is always about the employment that it can generate and the wage packets that it can provide for people. But last week, the Finance Secretary stood before Parliament to make the now annual announcement of emergency budget cuts, uh, with nearly £1 billion in cuts and adjustments. And at the heart of that was the £460 million being poured into the SNP's black hole instead of being invested in public services. And I, I was uh, reminded of a quote from um, uh, one Kate Forbes MSP, who said back in March, we have 
often lamented the way in which, during the past 30 years, revenues from oil and gas have been squandered on annual running costs, rather than establishing a sovereign wealth fund. What plans does the Scottish Government have to ensure that we will not lament a similar situation happening with options fees from our great, uh, great renewables potential in 30 years' time? Well, the, the Deputy First Minister didn't have to wait 30 years. Some 30 weeks later, she was losing the debate in the Cabinet, I'm afraid. So, does the, First Minister, the Deputy First Minister agree with Kate Forbes, MSP, or with the incompetent Finance Secretary about what should happen to these uh, monies? Because we, we, instead, even today, we've had protestations from the First Minister about the financial situation that supposedly has necessitated um, the, these keys. It said to the uh, Parliament that he has been cuts in year to his budget fundamentally untrue. All the independent experts agree. The Scottish Fiscal Commission, the Fraser Alder Institute, the Institute of Fiscal Studies, Audit Scotland, all of this was predicted and long so, and it was up to this government to get a grip of it. And that's how we get proper, steady investment in the kind of programmes that are set out in parts of this document today. And because there is, of course, huge potential in this area. And like Willie Rennie, um, I spent some time um, recently uh, uh, on uh, the boat out to the Sea Green wind farm, F fortunately not with Morris Golden. Uh, but, and it is inspiring, I have to say, it is inspiring um, and it is vital for our clean energy mission across the UK in reducing carbon emissions. But we have to note that almost none of it was made here. Almost none of it was made here. And it's simply not enough of it belongs to us as a country, as people, as citizens. We should have stakes in these projects. We should do. Because other foreign governments do. And they will generate billions of pounds for their citizens instead of for our citizens. And I agree with Richard Leonard on this. And I read much of his work that he published on this some 25 years ago about the shape of our economy and where we want to see the benefits flow to. And I have to say the establishment of GB Energy is absolutely critical to meeting this end. And I know that the SNP abstained last week on the creation of GB Energy. Goodness only knows why. Um, but I would commend to Kevin Stewart the Great British Energy Bill, which sets out this wholly owned public company, and particularly Section 3.2, no, if I can just continue, particularly Section 3.2, which sets out the statement of objects. And this was a question asked to me from those benches. It sets out in full the objects that are to be. So particularly that section, the production, distribution, storage and supply of clean energy, the reduction in greenhouse gas emissions from uh, uh, the production of, of fossil fuels, improvement in energy efficiency, and measures for ensuring the, uh, the security of energy supply. That's what GB Energy is for. And it's exactly for taking stakes in these kind of projects that it's been created so we can have benefits for our long-term future as a country. I'm afraid I'm just coming towards my closing. Uh, I'm in the last 30 seconds. So ownership is absolutely clear in that. And we should see a new focus on that kind of community benefit. Not £1,000 for the Scout Hall, but a share of the profits forever. And we have to see domestic manufacturing as part of that. That is the real community benefit. Jobs, wages, making sure that we can actually sustain that community, community and our country for the long term. Um, the design and the handling of Scotland as a process from start to end has been an, a case study in incompetence. From initially pricing the round at £75 million to selling it for a fraction of comparable licences internationally. And so in the end, and in the words of the Deputy First Minister, now squander the money. Let's face up to it. We have to make sure we can invest against some of the aspirations and the rest, or no strategy will deliver the kind of benefits that we need. Thank you. I now call Graham Simpson around seven minutes. Mr Simpson. Thank you very much. Um, and just to pick up on a theme of the debate today, if you spend too much time with Maurice Golden, you will get yourself into choppy waters. Ooh. Now, um, as, uh, as a member for Central Scotland, I also have to mention uh, Grangemouth today because the news uh, today has been uh, devastating um, and I just hope that the, the two, our two governments can work together to save that facility. Um, I do think it has a future and I'll go on to say why. Now the title of the debate today is Growing Scotland's Green Economy and I asked the uh, Deputy First Minister earlier about the announcement by Alexander Dennis, also in my region. They've got two plants uh, in Falkirk and Larbert, uh, that 160 jobs are at risk. In their 
press release um, announcing this uh, terrible news, they mention um, Scott Zeb 2. Now, members may not be aware of what Scott Zeb 2 is, but it's, Scot it's a Scottish Government fund. It funds uh, low emission or zero emission uh, buses or coaches. So, very much in, in, in keeping with uh, the debate today. Um, but the company uh, is saying, um, I'll just read out what they say, uh, government zero emission bus funding has disproportionately benefited competitors from lower cost and lower security economies. And in a letter to me from Fiona Hislop, um, she confirms that 66 per cent of the orders uh, from that fund have gone to China. That's the majority, of course. 17.6 per cent have gone to Alexander Dennis. Scottish-based. Now, for me, that's a problem. We've got uh, Scottish government money going to China and not to Scotland or even the rest of the UK. There is an issue there, and the Scottish government really needs to take a good look at this. Paul Davis, who's the managing director of Alexander Dennis, said, we're deeply disappointed that the ongoing effect of various government policies, he does mention the UK government as well, is now threatening some of these jobs. Competition is healthy, but when taxpayer money is spent with little domestic, industrial, economic or employment benefit and bus companies effectively are incentivized to buy from lower security economies, mm -hmm. it creates an incomprehensible dynamic and an uneven playing field. An uneven playing field. And that's, and that's the effect of this Scottish Government fund. So when we're talking about growing Scotland's green economy, we, look to, we really need to look closer to home. Now, I, I read with interest the Green Industrial Strategy publish, published yesterday. There's some well-intentioned stuff in there. Um, talks about maximising Scotland's wind economy, developing a self-sustaining carbon capture utilisation and storage sector, supporting green economy, professional and financial services with global reach, growing our hydrogen sector, establishing Scotland as a competitive centre for the clean energy intensive industries of the future. It all sounds good enough, but if we just take one of those, hydrogen, the strategy lays out actions that the government will take. They'll identify barriers, to hydrogen production uh, development. They'll encourage domestic demand for renewable and low carbon hydrogen and hydrogen products, support the sector to develop new place based hubs of co located hydrogen production and demand, maximise export opportunities for hydrogen and hydr hydrogen products. Now, when you see, presiding officer, words like identify, encourage, support in government documents, it often means that nothing will actually happen. Certainly. Deputy First Minister. In, in part, I agree with the member that I uh, don't love words like support and encourage. If you unpack, I happen to be on the page he's just read from, and underneath those high-level objectives, he'll see things that are specific, like the Aberdeen Hydrogen Hub, which is a specific, tangible example of the work that we're doing. Graham Simpson. And I can give the uh, Deputy uh, First Minister another idea. Um, I've quoted in committee EU Regulation 2023-1804 on the deployment of alternative fuels infrastructure. It's not, uh, you know, you'll never have heard me saying let's follow the EU, but I do on this one, because it says by the end of December 2025, there should be one recharging pool at, le at least every 60 kilometres, that's 37 miles, on the main road network in the EU. The regulation also does a number of other things in relation to hydrogen infrastructure for road vehicles, liquefied methane for road transport, electricity supply in ports, electricity for aircraft, railway infrastructure to include hydrogen and battery power. So you're seeing hydrogen fuel stations being put in along main routes throughout Europe. Yeah. Measurable outcomes with measurable carbon emission benefits. Do that, 
you create a market. Create a market, people start to change behaviour. And it's the same with it. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm actually... Uh, I won't, because uh, I think I'm out of time. I don't have any extra time. Um, so I think there are things we can do, and we're not doing them. So I think we just need to... You, know, you, know, you need to consider examples like that to create a market in hydrogen and create a market in hydrogen then we can benefit places like Grangemouth. Same as sustainable aviation fuel. So I'm coming uh, to a close. Um, I think um, it's clear that despite what the Cabinet Secretary was claiming earlier, the Scottish Government's record in climate change is poor. They've missed target after target, as Maurice Golden said, and the climate change bill won't change the climate. It's a misnomer. We don't know when carbon budgets will be set. We don't know what the new level of emission reduction ambition will be, and the government will be able to produce a climate change plan whenever it likes. Warm words won't cool the climate, but action might. Thank you. I now call on Kate Forbes to wind up the debate. I'd be grateful, Deputy First Minister, if you could take us up to just before five o'clock, please. Wonderful. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Presiding Officer. Well, I think it's been um, a, a good uh, debate. Um, the members obviously don't have confidence in themselves at a level that I have confidence in them to be able to read, digest and pontificate on a document which has been published uh, a day before. Um, I acknowledge that Graham Simpson did have time to uh, read it and to digest it. Uh, and I'm very happy to pick up with colleagues um, over the coming weeks, perhaps, or indeed months, uh, once they've had a chance to read it as well. Um, I'm not entirely uh, confident that the speech would be that much different um, if they had had the opportunity uh, to read it, digest and pontificate on it uh, to a greater uh, extent. But, uh, presiding officer, I think we have um, heard... Yes, I will. Richard Leonard. Does the First Minister accept that the Scottish TUC has read the Green Industrial Strategy as they were, I think, consulted about it? And therefore, what does she respond, how does she respond to them saying this is yet another example of government strategy that talks up potential without matching it with the necessary policy? David, first I am so delighted that Richard Leonard has put on the record the fact that we have uh, engaged uh, with partners and stakeholders in advance of the publication and uh, the comments that they have made uh, publicly uh, reflect uh, comments and discussions that we had uh, privately, although in more detail. Uh, the point that I made to them privately, which I'll put on the record now, is that this document very much needs to be seen as one in a suite of documents. So what are we doing with this uh, document? I know that many members have given suggestions and ideas, things that are missing in the document. Uh, this cannot be uh, an all-consuming document that does absolutely everything and name-checks everybody in it. The point here is to be essentially a window into Scotland. We hear time and time again from investors, developers, that uh, we aren't clear enough on our priority areas. It's one of the criticisms that came through in the investor panel, to be clear about what we want to achieve, to focus in on a few areas, and that is what we are seeking to do. But it will sit alongside the Just Transition Plan, uh, because they have different uh, audiences and they are focused on achieving slightly different aims. This is very much a prospectus uh, for uh, potential uh, uh, investment. In terms of um, some of the other uh, commentary that we've heard, uh, many have made the point that Scotland has unrivalled uh, natural resources, which hopefully is a point we can all uh, agree on, but the key is whether that creates jobs here in Scotland or uh, overseas in other countries. And I accept that that is one of the, the, the biggest challenges that we need to combat uh, on the cusp of this green uh, industrial revolution. I see great examples of businesses and organisations that are doing that already. I think in uh, response to Willie Rennie, I mentioned Flowcopter, for example, uh, and they are they 
build autonomous air systems, which is going to completely uh, change the nature of the industry. And as the Chief Executive put it to me yesterday, this is a Scottish business in the Scottish supply chain uh, based in Scotland that is going to completely disrupt uh, the industry and essentially make it cheaper uh, in replacing helicopters and safer when it comes to servicing the offshore energy uh, industry. So I think we do have to acknowledge uh, and rise above the what was at times exhausting negativity in certain uh, comments, uh, rise above that and identify where things are working well and look to replicate that as uh, the norm. Um, Lorna Slater uh, is somebody I have uh, long respected when it comes to uh, comments on the green industrial strategy. There are few in the chamber who have the lived experience and the professional experience that she has. And so I take uh, her comments uh, very seriously. She made uh, a comment which I think is at the heart of what we need to do, which is that where there is private money, uh, we shouldn't be displacing that with public funding. At a time where there is limited uh, capital funding, limited public funding, uh, it is absolutely imperative that that public funding basically is spent on public goods and public benefit and delivers a uh, return for uh, the nation in a way that is sustainable uh, and creates uh, fairness. And I think that is why this document in particular is our endeavour to attract private investment in areas where the public a uh, public penny cannot uh, be spent. Uh, we will look at how we can do uh, more to attract private investment in the right areas, according to our priorities, in a way that delivers uh, public uh, benefit for communities. Uh, but we need to do that at a time where, where our public finances are extremely stretched. Uh, and we saw that from the last week, just uh, how stretched uh, they are. I will. Patrick Harvey. I'm, I'm very grateful. I wonder if the Deputy First Minister will come on to the uh, economic arguments that were made in relation, for example, to the hoarding of wealth by the super-rich, by billionaire tax exiles like Jim Ratcliffe, who has failed the community of Grangemouth so grievously. Isn't this a fundamental reason why governments don't have the resources that they need to be able to invest in the green transition? Will the government come to that financialisation and that privatisation which is at the heart of the economic problems that we're facing. Deputy First well, Minister. In part, I agree with the fact that our natural assets in terms of our, um, our renewable energy must go towards delivering public good for the nation. So perhaps it's a different uh, example of the same principle right now across the Highlands and Islands, and Edward Mountain talked about it, that are communities that are seeing essentially the privatisation of a, a natural resource, a natural asset, uh, and not seeing any benefit coming to them uh, directly. Uh, and this is what we need to try and protect against in sharp contrast to what has happened before. And you he talked about um, the example of, of Grangemouth. Um, in terms of where we go uh, next, I think it is a huge relief that would-be investors and potential investors do appear to listen less to the opposition and more to the facts, which is why they are interested uh, in investing in Scotland. Uh, we have been clear in the Green Industrial Strategy and in other documents that we publish that we expect those who want to come and invest in Scotland to do so in a way that is consistent with our values and consistent in a way that delivers uh, a public good uh, and creates uh, good, well-paid jobs. Yeah, I think I'm running out of time, but go for it. Douglas Slomston. I'll, I'll, I'll be brief, Deputy First Minister. Um, when we talk about uh, investment coming in, what would help investment would actually be the release of the energy uh, strategy. You know, where we're told it was it was almost ready um, just before the general election, but it's been delayed. So, can the Deputy First Minister update us when that uh, strategy will come out, and will it remove the presumption against oil and gas? Uh, uh, well, of course, uh, the member will be able to read that strategy when it is published. I can't give him a specific date uh, right now, but it is part of the suite of documents uh, that we want to publish as quickly as possible, the first of which is the Green Industrial Strategy. Um, Presiding officer, I appreciate I'm running out of time, but with my last minute, I wanted to touch on a point uh, that Michael Mara uh, made, and it's not just because I delight, I, I'm delighted when I am quoted, uh, but to talk about uh, GB Energy specifically, because we've had some really good 
engagement with the UK government on GB Energy. And the point I made to Michael Shanks in the first ever communication we had is that we're willing to engage with GB Energy. The two things that we want in response is for the Scottish uh, devolved institutions to be treated with parity. So Crown Estate Scotland to be given uh, the same respect, um, dialogue and indeed powers that the Crown Estate um, elsewhere in the UK uh, is given. And secondly, for GB Energy to really to Scotland. I uh, don't know what I said, but there it's back on. Um, uh, to, 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 to really act as a boost and to work with initiatives that are already happening. So rather than come in and duplicate work that is already underway, to come in alongside it and to build those partnerships. Those are the two uh, conditions I set out and those are the two conditions that I hope will be delivered. And so in summary, presiding officer, the green industrial strategy delivers on our objectives. There's much more work to be done. Everything is in implementation and I look forward to working with all who have a stake in delivering a just transition and maximising prosperity for this generation and the next. Thanks. Thank you. That concludes the debate on programme for government, growing Scotland's green economy. It's now time to move on to the next item of business. And there are four questions to be put as a result of today's business. Now, can I remind members that if the amendment in the name of Douglas Lumsden is agreed to, the amendments in the name of Sarah Boyack and Lorna Slater will fall. The first question is that Amendment 14431.2 in the name of Douglas Lumsden, which seeks to amend Motion 14431 in the name of Kate Forbes on Programme for Government Growing Scotland's Green Economy, be agreed. Are we all agreed? The Parliament is not agreed, therefore we will move to a vote and there will be a short suspension to allow members to access digital voting. <laughs>